We come this week to Psalm 11 in our study through the Psalms. And I, I think I've neglected to say this uh, the last couple of times. If you haven't read Psalm 11 <clears throat> before listening to this video, I encourage you to pause the video and read Psalm 11. In fact, I, if, if you're doing these studies with us, read these Psalms like for next week, read Psalm 12. Uh, after this this one is over, read Psalm 12 from now until the next video comes up. Read it in as many translations as you have available. Read it. Read everything you can find on it. Let the Psalm speak to you. Make notes uh, of your reactions and the things that come to mind as you read this Psalm. But in Psalm 11, as we're doing the, the overview, the study sheet, what kind of psalm is this? And we, we continue on with this, this series of psalms that, that sound very similar, very distressing, very um, tough times in, in David's life. As we believe David is the writer of, of this series of psalms. As we come to Psalm 11, we see that the superscription tells us that it is for the choir director. Uh, he I, he probably didn't write this specifically for the choir, but this was written during a period of time when he was going through the struggle, and then it is adapted to be used in their worship. Uh, it, 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 just on a side note, if you look in your hymnals, for those of you who still use hymnals, if you notice who wrote the hymn, there are, and I think I've mentioned this before, but there are many what I call professional hymn writers. Fanny Crosby, Philip Bliss, many like that. That You'll see many of their poems or their songs, hymns, become worship hymns. Someone else may have put the music to it, but it becomes a part of our, our worship hymnal. Now, what prompted that writing, we don't know. Sometimes, in, in my own case, uh, in, in writing uh, poetry specifically, or uh, when, when we were going through very difficult times in our lives and caring for our parents and, and in-laws and, and our children, I wrote things during those times of struggle. And then now I go back and read them, and they are an encouragement. So perhaps they were written for that. Other hymn writers are... Uh, I lovingly call them one-hit wonders, but it's it, it may be a specific uh, incident in their lives. Uh, uh, I, I can't think of the writer's name, but the one who wrote it is well with my soul. There's a specific story behind that, and there are many others the same way. But whatever David went through, and whenever he wrote this psalm, then it became a part of their worship, and he gives directions for the choir director. It's also called a psalm of faith. And and I I look at it as also a psalm with current day overtones. This much scripture does, but every once in a while you'll run into a section of scripture or a psalm specifically that it looks so much like today's culture that you, you just can't help but notice it. Well, what, what feeling does this psalm evoke for you as you read it through the first time? For me, it, it gave me peace in the midst of conflict. That's what I sense when I read this. We'll see that when we get into it. Who's speaking, the psalmist is speaking of his own situation, but he's speaking universally. Again, this is, as, as we saw uh, last week in, in Psalm 10, this is a universal, Psalm 10 was a universal cry. <clears throat> Psalm 11 is a universal response. What about this psalm reminds me of Jesus? Well, uh, particularly verse 4, where it speaks of his, uh, it reminds me of, of Revelation 1, 4, uh, excuse me, Revelation 1, 14, uh, describing Jesus as his eyes were like a flame of fire. What did I learn about God from this psalm? Well, all verses 4 through 7, we'll talk about that in a minute. What other scriptures or hymns come to mind? What, what thoughts trigger in your mind when you read this. What does this remind you of? Does it remind you of other scriptures? Does it remind you of hymns? Does it remind you of secular songs? Verse 1 reminds me of, of Job 2 verse 9 where where Job's wife told him, curse God and die. The David's counselors were saying, just get out of here. Don't face it. 
uh, a hymn that comes to mind is, Where could I go but to the Lord? Hide me, O thou great Jehovah. Hold me close till the storm passes by, and, oh, sometimes the shadows are deep. Hymn after hymn that resonate in our hearts. And, and, and let me add this on a personal note. If we don't sing and teach these great hymns of the faith to our children, what a great bastion of hope we are neglecting and ultimately losing. I can give you example after example of times in my life when, when I was going through a very, very fearful time. And it was hymns, those memorized hymns that gave me courage. Oh, sometimes the shadows are deep. Hold me close till the storm passes by. Those things encourage me. What do we hold on to if we don't have those scriptures and those hymns to give us courage. I know when when sitting at, at the hospital uh, during the night because I didn't have a, a uh, regular go-to daytime job, I often had the task of sitting with whomever in the hospital at night. And I had the hymn, uh, How Firm a Foundation, written out on a yellow sheet of legal pad page. And I, I read that night after night till I wore that piece of paper out. I carried it in, in my billfold for years. I'm, I may still have it there. But those words, what more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand held by my righteous, omnipotent hand. How many nights that hymn carried me through. Well, I'm getting a little off track there, but I can't help it. I love hymns. So, okay, <clears throat> Psalm 11. In my Bible, I have a note at this psalm which says, a short, simple psalm with an enormous importance. This psalm is, is, is very important. For it's, very, it's very short, but it's very powerful. When I talk through these psalms uh, in, a, in a group setting at one time, uh, as we began Psalm 11, someone commented from Psalm chapter 10 and asked the question, will we ever get to see the psalmist's prayer answered? Well, if you remember in chapter 10, the psalmist cried out, Why, and we said, why does it seem like, Why dost thou stand afar off, O Lord? Why dost thou hide thyself in time of trouble. And they said, are we ever going to get to see that, that question answered? And, and I said, well, in one respect, no, not specifically, but we do get to see God's wrath poured out on the wicked at various times in scriptures, especially in the book of Revelation. But the psalmist may or may not have seen his prayer answered in his lifetime. If David wrote the psalm, and I, and I believe that he did, he did see God's mighty hand at work time after time. But we don't know if he saw an answer that specific time. In 2 Thessalonians, I believe it's in chapter 1, it speaks about the wrath of God. And I may have mentioned this last week. I don't remember. But we see the, the wrath of God being brought when Christ returns at, at his second coming. You and I have this tendency to to think if we don't get to see justice done, justice is not done. God's timing is not our timing. We may not see justice done in our lifetimes, but make no mistake, God's justice will be done. Well, in that, that same setting, someone answered during the study and said, it looks like Psalm 11 answers that question. Well, yes and no. Yes, in that God judges but no, in that it's not a specific answer to a specific question, but we know God does judge. And we'll see how God answers that cry of the desperate person in this chapter. Well, like many other Psalms, we don't know the circumstances for this one. We, we don't know when it was written. Some, some commentators think uh, it was David's persecution from Saul. That takes place in 1 Samuel 19 and following. Others think it's, uh, again, Absalom's rebellion in 2 Samuel 15 and following. In each of these cases, David is forced to flee for his life. Under Saul's uh, persecution, 
David has already been anointed by Samuel to be king, but Saul is still king on the throne in Jerusalem. And Saul persecutes David, chases after him, tries to kill him. In 2 Samuel, when Absalom persecutes him, Absalom is trying to, uh, uh, what's the word? He's trying to perform a coup, a, a takeover of the kingship. David is much older and he's in frail health, but uh, in, in that case, David is on the throne, but Absalom tries to usurp his authority. We don't know which one that was. Whatever it was, David was forced to flee for his life. But, but really, I think in order to fully understand the impact of this psalm, you, you have to get alone with this psalm and you have to meditate on its words. Again, it's a very, very short psalm. And I encourage you to read it very slowly, to look at the words, to think them through, to apply it to your own life, whether you're going through something like that now or you have in the past or you will in the future. I'm reminded, <clears throat> I heard David Jeremiah once say, uh, you're either in a spiritual struggle, you've just come out of a spiritual struggle, or you're about to go into a spiritual struggle. That's that's our lot in life. But, but back to this. When you think seriously, when you really think seriously about what this psalm is saying, this psalm speaks to today. It, it, it speaks whatever today is. It speaks to our current culture. Uh, today, in, in J July the, or whatever today is, July the 20th, I think, uh, 2022. In July 2022, this psalm speaks to us. More, more about uh, what it is saying. More than any psalm we've studied so far, this psalm speaks to today. At least for me it does. This psalm can speak to us where we are in any culture, but it speaks especially loud today. Well, the psalmist begins Psalm 11 in the same vein that he that he finished up Psalm 10. In fact, many, many scholars think these two flow together, one into the other. And he finished up in Psalm chapter 10 with a note of faith. And he begins the same way here, he says, In the Lord I take refuge. And you can almost you can almost hear that said in a defiant way. I don't care what you say. In the Lord is where I take my refuge. But before I, we catch our breath, he, he states the reason for that affirmation. Who has said something to him? We don't know. It is dire circumstances in which he finds himself. Apparently, his counselors, uh, it, particularly if this takes place uh, when he's on the throne, he has a multitude of counselors. Apparently, he's getting advice to get out of there. You got to go. You got to hide. You you got you got to run. And David says, "In the Lord is where I take my refuge." And he he replies, "How do you say to me? How do you say to my soul, flee as a bird to the mountains?" For behold, you got to look out. The wicked bend the bow. They're, they're making ready their arrows to strain. They're going to shoot in the darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what are you going to do? What are the righteous going to do? They, they, are, they are crying out to David, you got to get out of there. What are you going to do? What are we going to do when times get tough? Are we going to run? Are we going to hide? Are we going to save ourselves? They go on, the wicked have the bow bent, or we might say they've got the gun cocked, or they've got the hand grenade launchers loaded, or the court documents have been filed, whatever the circumstances are. Either way, whatever, the enemy is ready. The psalmist says that they are ready to shoot in the darkness at the upright in heart. Now, there's several ways to, to read that statement. We might read it as they are taking a shot in the dark. They don't really know what they're shooting at. They're just shooting blindly. Could be that. They're just hoping they hit something important. Other translations say that they are ready to shoot from the shadows. They're shooting out of the dark, indicating that it's an evil person who is in the dark. They are in the dark. They are not in the light, not having knowledge. They're evil. They are from the dark. And the psalmist, and we are told at times like this, you got to go. I mean, you got to run, you've got to hide. But, but I don't think the psalmist is saying, I'm just, 
I'm just going to stand here in harm's way. I'm just going to let them shoot at me because I take my refuge in the Lord. I, I think when we are in physical danger, we must seek refuge. We, we must flee. There, there comes a time when, when we must say, in the Lord I take refuge, but, but there are times when we really must flee. When, I mean, you can't stand in the middle of the interstate. You've got to use a little bit of common sense. You've got to do what the Lord leads you to do. Your refuge, your trust may still be in the Lord, but you've got to use the sense that God gave you. The word flee here means to wander, W-A-N-D-E-R, to wander uh, or, or to mourn. It, ha it has that sense of aimless motion. I, I call it mindless activity. It refers to a person moving about aimlessly without a home. It's a sign of panic, regardless of what is happening. And the psalmist is saying, I don't care if I still have to go somewhere, I am not leaving in a panic. It's a controlled leave. Now, I don't know about you, but as I begin to read and think about this psalm, I begin to think about Christians worldwide who are being persecuted. I mean, what do they do? We're fortunate in that we've, and I, and I don't mean this as a blanket statement, and certainly I haven't had to stand up and face someone in fear of my life for my faith. But there are Christians all over the world who have. So what do they do? Are they just supposed to stand there and say, in the, in the Lord I take my refuge, kill me if you want? Or are they supposed to take action and try to flee and try to hide? That's, that's, that's a hard question to, to answer there. The, the very words of verse 2 cause our hearts to shudder when we think about them in the context of persecution. The wicked bend the bow. The wicked, I, I think my mind goes back to when I originally studied this and I originally wrote this. I, I, I think it was along about that time in Iraq where we began seeing pictures come out in the news of of Christians lined up in uh, orange jumpsuits and being beheaded. That, that was what we were dealing with at that time. And, and we think about that. The wicked bend the bow, or they pull back the, the blade, or whatever it is. They make ready their ar arrow upon the string to shoot in the darkness, I believe from the darkness, at the upright in heart. <clears throat> and so we even ask, if the foundations are destroyed, what are the righteous going to do? If the foundations of the belief are destroyed, if, if all of those who, who are our mentors and the ones we, we look to, if they are taken out, what's going to happen? What can the righteous do? This reminds me, and I'm going to share this story. This reminds me of the martyrdom of one of the early church fathers named Polycarp. You, you may or may not be familiar with Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. He was a disciple of the apostle John. He was, he was in direct descendancy, we might say, in the faith. He was an apostle of John's. He was sentenced to death around 155 A.D. His story is well documented. You can, you can do searches on it. If you have a little book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, or it goes into great details of his story. But just briefly, this is it. When he found out about the sentence of death that had put, been put upon him, the first thing he did was try to escape. As we said earlier, he took the common sense approach. He tried to escape. He didn't just say, let him come and get me. He tried to escape, but he was hunted from house to house, and he was a very old man, and he, he finally surrendered. When the soldiers saw him, I mean, they just knew they were after Polycarp. They really, you know, they didn't have like a wanted poster. This is what he looks like. They were amazed that he was such an old man. I mean, you sent this many soldiers after this one old man? Well, anyway, when the soldiers finally found him, um, he finally surrendered to them. <clears throat> he offered the soldiers a meal. And he asked them if he could have one hour to spend time in prayer. And so they granted that. When he finished his prayers, he told them he was ready to go. And, and just before he was taken to the authorities, and he was questioned. And they said, you know, you're an old man. Look, all you got to do, just, just take this little pinch of incense, throw it in the fire, say, Caesar is Lord, 
and we'll let you go. That's all you've got to do. Look, that's such a minor thing. That's all you've got to do. Well, at first he, he did, just didn't answer, and they, and they kept pressing him, and, and he finally said, I will not do as you advise. So then he was taken to a tribunal. When the pro counsel asked him if he was Parley Carp, he said that he was. Pro counsel said basically the same thing. Consider thyself, consider thine own age. Take pity on thy age. Look, you're an old man. Look, your life is about over anyway. No need to suffer in your last days. He still refused to recant. Pro counsel kept saying, all you got to do is swear. Just swear. I mean, you can all, all, almost imagine them saying, please, just, I don't, I don't want to kill you. Just do this, and I'll release you. Denounce Christ. Well, that was the last straw for Polycarp. Polycarp replied with his famous declaration, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Well, there's a whole lot more to the story, but finally... Finally, the, the, uh, the emperor has had it and takes him to the stadium and he's going to be burned at the stake. And get this, the Jews of the city hated him so badly that even though it was a Saturday that he was to be killed, to be burned at the stake, even though it was their Sabbath day, even though it broke their Sabbath, the Jews of the city carried the wood to burn him at the stake. Those who were there recorded that as he burned, they said, We received in our nostrils such a fragrance as proceeds from frankincense or some other precious perfume. Polycarp first sought safety, but when it was obvious that he was going to die, he took his <laughs> refuge in Jesus but were the foundations of Christianity destroyed? No, they weren't. Jesus said the gates of hell could not prevail, will not prevail against the church. The psalmist puts it this way in the rest of this, this chapter. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Now we know the Lord is not confined to a single place on the earth. He is in his holy temple. Well, where is that? The Lord's throne is in heaven. A.W. Tozer said that there is no place in the universe where one is closer to God than any other place. Anywhere in the universe, you are equally <laughs> close to God. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. But when the, when the psalmist says... God is in his holy temple. That is indicating he is in the place of judgment. He is on his throne. God is also omniscient. He knows everything that is going on. Never, never will you find God saying, Oh, I didn't see that coming. Never will you find God wringing his hands. What are we going to do? God is in his holy temple. He is on the throne. That phrase, his eyelids touch the sons of men. That intrigued me. You know, I, I study uh, the majority of the time in the New, New International Translation. Uh, I go back to the King James Version, and, and I read from the New Living Translations and others. But, but that phrase, because I am intrigued by the word-by-word -word translation. What does that mean? His eyelids test the sons of men. And I couldn't figure it out. So I studied it, and I studied it, studied the words, and I found that it is a picture of someone squinting their eyes to see something more closely. I mean, you know how it is, especially if you wear glasses. Uh, if you want to see something afar off, you, you may squint your eyes, or you may squint to read. That's what that is, squinting, to scrutinize, to read more closely. God's eyes not only behold, they not only see what is happening, he scrutinizes the wicked's actions and their motives. The psalmist goes on, the Lord tests the righteous, or you could say and or but, the wicked, the one who loves violence, his soul hates. 
It is true, as James 1.13 tells us, that God never tempts anyone, but he does test us. Now, what's the difference? If you read James, it's interesting if you go to our study on James, you find that, that the word tempt and the word test is the same word in the Greek. So which is it? Depends on the context of how it's used. Is it, is it a test to see if we will fail? Is God saying, I'm going to see if you'll fail? No. It's a test to prove that we won't. It's a test to prove our strength. And we could go through all kinds of, of uh, examples throughout Scripture. That, that test that God put Abraham through uh, when he took his son Isaac. Take your son, your only son whom you were. Did, did God really want to know? Did God have to question whether Abraham would pass the test? No, God knew. But Abraham had to know. All the questions that I think we mentioned last time, Jesus saying, or maybe I've used it this week, I don't remember, but Jesus saying in John 6 to the disciples, are you going to leave too? He knew what their hearts were, but they had to know what their hearts, hearts were. We've all been through things that if someone had told us what we'd have to do, we'd never believe we could make it. We, I, I could never live through that, but we go through it and we look back, and we did. But God knew, but he had to show us. Sometimes I've jokingly said that God has a higher opinion of me than I have of myself. But the trial of the righteous results in their approval, but the test of the wicked results in their punishment. He goes on to say, the wicked, the one who loves violence, God's soul hates We've talked before about the things that God hates, and God hates the wicked. So what will be their punishment? Upon the wicked he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. Now think about that phrase for a minute. Fire and brimstone and burning wind. I mean, we, we're in uh, a time in history and uh, right now where... Uh, Parts of the country and parts of the world are going through intense heat, burning winds. Uh, it just uh, We were outside the other day, and I told you, I said, it feels like we're in a convection oven. We were in an oven, and, and wind was blowing, but the wind was hot. And it's worse other places than it is here. But that phrase, fire and brimstone and burning wind, and I have to wonder if that's a picture of, of what hell is like. Raining snares, fire and brimstone, and burning wind. Now that's pretty graphic when you think about it. But why does God judge? Verse 7, For the Lord is righteous, and He loves righteousness. What will that do for the psalmist? What, what do those words do for the psalmist? What do those words do for us? What does those words do for Christians around the world who are being persecuted? The upright will behold his face. We will see him face to face. As usual, the Hebrew word means much more than its, than its face value, than its mere definition. The King James Version says that his countenance doth behold or is be helped by the upright. The righteous man's countenance, the righteous man will be seen and will be be helped by God, by the upright. The word countenance there is more than just the face. May the Lord shine his countenance upon you. That, that's more than just may the Lord look at you. It, it, is, it is a word that, that refers to what we would call body language. <clears throat> my mother used to say that she could tell what was going on in my heart by looking at my face, and, and I dare say most of you can do the same with, with your children or your spouses. You can tell if someone is happy or if they are upset just simply by looking in their eyes, by looking at their face. And it's not just the face, it's the image, the, the shoulders droop, or it, just a defeated look about the person. It's the whole demeanor. That's the countenance. The upright will behold. The upright will behold, they will look at, they will see, they will perceive the very countenance of God, the body language of God. 
You know, we were, we were reminded of, of Stephen in, in Acts chapter 7, we, in Stephen's martyrdom. When, when Stephen was martyred, when they were stoning him with, with stones, we find him saying, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Stephen beheld the face of God, the countenance, the body language of God. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So did Stephen, so did Polycarp, so did those who are, will those who are being persecuted, and so will we. So let's pray. Oh Father, what an image this psalm brings to mind. As we see our brothers and sisters around the world being persecuted, like Polycarp, all they have to say is, we are told, is, I reject Christianity, but yet they won't and they die. Sometimes horrible deaths. We don't know what we would do in a similar life and death situation. But we are confronted daily with choices to make regarding being faithful to our Savior. Oh God, give us courage. Give us courage to stand in the face of opposition, whether it comes from a gun or a gavel or a smirking face. May we say with the psalmist, In the Lord I take refuge. For the Lord is in his holy temple, and the upright will behold his face. We know that, we, we cling to that hymn, that on that day we shall see him face to face, the one who saved us by his grace. And it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. I hope this psalm brings a blessing and an encouragement to you. May you have a great and God-filled blessed day. Amen.